Okay, I think I'm doing this right. I was instructed to put this on, and um, I'm, I have to set it here so I will be tethered to the podium. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. It's a particular delight for me to be back here at UBC um, and at Green College, where I uh, attended lectures like this quite frequently as I was doing my MA and PhD. So. Uh, it's really delightful to be here uh, and to be talking to you from this perspective now as someone who has been living in Montana a w for a while and I've been trying to unravel this relationship between Shakespeare and Montana and Shakespeare and the American West. So as Mark uh, just mentioned, I've just completed a book manuscript on this topic. So this is tonight's talk uh, comes out of that research I've been doing. A HarperCollins book published a decade ago entitled State by State, A Panoramic Portrait of America features a map of the U.S. emblazoned with icons that epitomize what each state is known for. Arizona has a cactus, Iowa has an iricorn, Kentucky a racing horse. What image was chosen for Montana? Is it a cowboy? A mountain? Someone fly fishing? No, it's Shakespeare. The authors of this state-by-state -state book explain that if there's one thing all Montanans have in common, other than a disdain for speed limits and a thing for huckleberries, it is a love for William Shakespeare. Is this bold statement grounded in any sense of lived experience in Montana? Having just completed this manuscript, I have a lot to say on this topic. But this evening, I want to consider just one aspect of this story the fascinating intersections between performing Shakespeare and performing the West. I particularly love this cartoon because it gets at Shakespeare and our disregard for speed limits. Here is a typical painting by one of Montana's favorite sons, cowboy artist, storyteller, and author Charlie Russell. His images of the Montana landscape in the late 19th and early 20th centuries are characterized by sweeping panoramas of horses, Indians, and cowboys in these settings. The scenic splendor of such a landscape painting does the kind of cultural work that has saddled Montana with the cliches that it seems unable or unwilling to shake off. These scenes, however, do have origins. The iconic images associated with the American West mountain men, vigilantes seeking justice, and yes, these cowboys too, are derived from historical people and situations. Yet almost as soon as people tread the frontier, these personas were co-opted as part of a complex performance of westernness that was a vital part of settling the frontier in the 19th century. No name is more associated with performing the West than Buffalo Bill Cody, Pony Express rider, Army Scout, and yes, Buffalo Hunter. Cody realized that there was a widespread popular fascination with the kind of life he had led. So he developed Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, an outdoor extravaganza dramatizing frontier life. This roadshow, which ran from 1881 to 1917 across America and Europe, has been aptly described as half circus, half history lesson, mixing sentimentality with sensationalism. The exploits of Wild Bill Hickok, Annie Oakley, Sitting Bull, and others were portrayed with high dramatic flair, and spectators would witness these iconic Western figures and attendant fantasies of lawlessness, even as they sensed their own shrinking frontiers. Buffalo Bill's success underlines the important fact that the West was always a performance, and it has never ceased to be so. The 1946 Irving Berlin musical, Annie Get Your Gun, which is about characters in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, popularized the song, There's No Business Like Show Business. But even today, the insatiable box office appeal of myths of the West in filmic westerns show no signs of abating. In a reflection on Montana's culture today, ethnographer Norman Denzen calls Montana a liminal place, both a performance and a place for performances. New stories, a place betwixt and between the past and the future. I am interested in how Shakespeare is part of these intersections between time, place, and performativity in Montana. My work follows from the many impressive studies that have been done about Shakespeare and America, specifically those devoted to Shakespeare and the West. 
A specific focus on Montana, however, tells a story that cuts against some of what has been said on this topic. As the area of the American West that was settled last and that, was cons that consistently has fashioned itself as endlessly large and empty, Montana has been envisioned as a stage, and these stage associations, both metaphorical and literal, have allowed for a more prolonged and nuanced engagement with Shakespeare than most other places in the West. Tracing Shakespeare's role in the formation of Montana's Western identity understands a deeper understanding of these myths. Conversely, tracing Shakespeare's presence in this way enables us to better understand the kind of cultural work he did and continues to do in the place that I have come to call my home. I'll be dividing this paper into four sections. The first is about frontiersmen and their encounters with Shakespeare. The second about literal Shakespeare performances in the mining towns of Montana. The third about the role of women in Shakespearean performance. And then I'm going to talk a bit about contemporary Shakespeare productions that look back to the alluring symbols of the Old West. Part one, good Shakespeare hunting. In the 2015 blockbuster film, The Revenant, based on a historical event from 1823, has anyone seen this film, The Revenant? It's terrible, okay. <laughs> a young, wide-eyed fur trapper named Jim Bridger tries to do the right thing after Hugh Glass, who is played by Leonardo DiCaprio, is nearly fatally mauled by a grizzly bear. The young Bridger spends the bulk of the movie looking terrified, uncertain, and desperate to exonerate himself from any wrongdoing. This characteristic of Bridger is so different from the way he is usually portrayed by historians, epitomized in this portrait that makes him look as hard, experienced, and rocky as the Bridger mountain range, which I can see from my Bozeman home, and that's the one here on the right, named for, for Jim Bridger. Because I'm a Shakespearean scholar and not a historian of the 19th century American West, Bridger first entered my consciousness through the widely circulated anecdotes about this American man's fascination with the English poet and playwright. It seems inevitable, in fact, that every reference to Shakespeare in the West begins with these stories. Multiple versions of Bridger's love of and encounters with Shakespeare survive from 19th century accounts, providing an array of fascinating anecdotes, some of which may indeed be tall tales. Such stories about Bridger began to circulate in print as early as 1864, and no doubt they had a rich oral history preceding this. They paint an, a vivid picture of a grizzled, illiterate, outspoken mountain man who had a love for Shakespeare's stories and language. Numerous witnesses were fascinated by the seeming incongruity between Bridger as an uncouth, uneducated trail guide and the notions of Shakespeare as an arbiter of classical genteel culture. And out of this fascination grew a richly varied web of tales on this topic. The narratives agree that Bridger became intent upon owning a Shakespeare book, but because he was illiterate, he required an intermediary who could read the plays to him. Some say this was a fellow soldier, a hired hand, a German boy, a German boy or even the Irish nobleman Sir St. George Gore, for whom Bridger served as a guide during his years hunting big game in the West. The oral component of these stories is crucial. For Bridger is depicted listening intently, spellbound for a time, until he explodes in a negative reaction to what he hears. He apparently had a tendency to criticize Shakespeare's characters. Speaking of the usually beloved Sir John Falstaff, Bridger said that their big Dutchman, Mr. Fullstuff, was a little bit too fond of lager beer and suggested that it might have been better for the old man if he had stuck to good old bourbon whiskey. A stronger reaction accompanied Bridger's outrage at the moment in Richard III when the tyrant king uh, murders the princes in the tower. Bridger, according to many sources, threw the book in the fire upon hearing that story. In another version, he brandished his gun, vowing to kill Richard. One officer's wife reported that Bridger exclaimed, Shakespeare must have had a bad heart and been as damned mean as a Sioux to have written such scoundrelism as that. Was this the end of the short-lived love affair that Bridger had for Shakespeare? Most stories say yes, but one compelling recollection 
was that for years afterward, in fact, it was amusing to hear Bridger quote Shakespeare. He could give quotation after quotation and was always ready to do so. Sometimes he seasoned it with a broad oath, so ingeniously inserted as to make it appear to the listener that Shakespeare himself had used the same language. This amusing depiction of Bridger's hybrid speech points to a key similarity between the illiterate mountain man and the playwright from rural England. They both relished the use of memorable turns of phrase, creative metaphors, and language that could fully express the range of human emotions. Bridger's use of Elizabethan language as part of his own verbal patterns likewise attests to a flexibility in what could constitute the role of a mountain man. In the end, his quirky and contradictory characteristics were a necessary component of making him a, a fitting subject for frontier lore. Decades before these embellished accounts of Bridger were written, he was part of an expedition in which the men gathered in buffalo skin shelters during the winters and read Shakespeare to one another alone on, uh, during long winter nights, discussing him and other authors in what one trapper, Osborne Russell, referred to as Rocky Mountain College. The paucity of occupations for the mountain men, especially during winter encampments, made books prize possessions. The first newspaper in Montana was not founded until 1864. So until that time, reading material was limited to the books that mountain men and pioneers carried with them. And carry them, they did. The wagon trains could be counted on to have books, and numerous historical sources substantiate that the volumes that they were most likely to have was the King James Bible and the collected works of Shakespeare. Several witnesses reported that Bridger asked others what the best book ever written was, and when he heard it was a Shakespeare work, Bridger made a journey to the main road and lay in wait for a wagon train and bought a copy from some emigrants. One detailed account narrates an extensive dialogue in which Bridger enters into some hard bargaining with a traveler who wants to buy a yoke of oxen, but Bridger refuses until he realizes this man possesses a copy of Shakespeare. Once he is assured that this is, in fact, a genuine Shakespeare book, Bridger is content to trade the oxen for the tome. Such a trade means that he was paying $150 to $200 for the Shakespeare collection. The enormous price, even if apocryphal, points to the value of the book, a value determined not by its practical usage on the frontier or its marketplace price, but by a belief that it contains something more intangible that Bridger sought. Was it wisdom, poetry, insight into history, or simply arresting tales that captured his imagination? It could have been any or all of these reasons, but because Bridger never wrote an account of his own life, our view of his relationship to Shakespeare is mediated by second and third hand observers. The story of Shakespeare in Montana is built of anecdotes like these, circulating in multiple versions and not verifiable by historical record. The tales that people choose to tell are a testimony to how consistently travelers through this huge frontier reached for Shakespeare's words and works and characters. But in those tellings, there's also something more, a desire to cultivate stories about the West, populated by men such as Bridger, who also possessed an ability to appreciate the arbiter of European and Eastern US culture. Such legends participated in a literary settling of the frontier. They brought Shakespeare to the stage of Montana, but did so on their own terms. In this respect, perhaps Bridger's story supports Turner's frontier hypothesis, which points to adaptation, invention, and individualism as integral to American identity. Bridger was no doubt responsible for narrating some of his own adventures, for there is ample information about other historical figures who authored their own mythic participation in Westness, like Hugh Glass, who escaped from the Grizz grizzly bear uh, mauling. Perhaps, though, the most notorious example of a very carefully constructed Western persona is that of George Armstrong Custer. The famous general of the 7th Cavalry, which was soundly defeated by the Lakota, Lakota and Cheyenne tribes at the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. Custer was an educated Easterner with a love of theater. He attended plays regularly in New York and formed a close friendship with the notable Shakespearean actor Lawrence Barrett, who appeared frequently on stage alongside Edwin Booth. It is no surprise that Custer loved the theater. 
for he had a flair for drama in his personal life. And like a character in a play, he transformed himself repeatedly. By sitting for portraits, dressing in Western clothing, and presenting himself through speeches, essays, and letters, he constructed a persona to suit his ambitions. And most of the time, the persona was that of a Western frontiersman. In a recent biography, T.J. Stiles notes that Custer projected a new image of himself through the lens of the frontier. But he cast himself as the cosmopolitan sophisticate who mastered the wildness, inserting ref knowing references to New York in essays about rattlesnake broiling, buffalo hunting, and Indian fighting. Part of showing such sophistication involved a self-conscious reflection on the Shakespearean characters that he and Barrett loved so well. Provocatively, Stiles posits that Custer deliberately modeled himself after Henry V. And indeed, it is likely that Custer was leaning on the Shakespearean source as the inspiration for his planned reformation, from the rowdy youngster who was court-martialed during his time at West Point to the glorious general of the Seventh Cavalry. In 1872, Custer, donning his well-known frontier buckskin hunting costume, went on an expedition with Buffalo Bill and others. They shot scores of bison, told stories around the campfire, and reveled in the opportunity to subdue the wilderness and its creatures. Sadly, there was no Jaques present to question the environmental ethics of such endeavors. Buffalo Bill, the consummate entertainer, loved, though, to envision what it would be like if he performed in Shakespeare's plays. Responding to critics who, um, who complained that his lowbrow entertainments were driving out Shakespearean actors such as Edwin Booth, Buffalo Bill bragged that he would do Hamlet in a buckskin suit, and when my father's ghost appeared doomed for a certain time and et cetera, I shall say to Jack, rope the, cat, the cuss in, Jack. As Richard III, I shall fight with pistols and hunting knives. In Romeo and Juliet, I shall put a half-breed squaw on the balcony and make various other interpretation of Shakespeare's words to suit myself. Buffalo Bill was a master of blurring the lines between fantasy and reality, of using the icons of the West in a self-referential manner. So it is not surprising that he saw ways in which the, in which the endlessly adaptable Shakespeare could be entirely at home in the American West. As Buffalo Bill's rejoinder to the Booth fans suggests, the opportunity to see performances of the West existed side by side with opportunities to see Shakespeare performed in the West. In the late 19th century, itinerant performers were everywhere, and Shakespeare's plays were by far the most frequent material on the newly constructed stages of the frontier. Which brings me to my second section, Mining Shakespeare. A decade ago, one of HBO's most successful series was Deadwood. Does anyone see Deadwood ever? Yeah. Uh, it's a depiction of 19th century gunslinging and corruption in Dakota Territory, featuring iconic and historical Western figures such as Wild Bill Hickok, Calamity Jane, and Wyatt Earp. One recurring character is the actor manager, Jack Langrish, who is credited with opening the frontier to the theatrical culture. He was born in Ireland in 1825, but emigrated to the US at the age of 20. After some time there, Langrish moved to Central City, Colorado, where he began a successful career. In the American West, Langrish gathered many of the acting stars of the day, performing to sold out audiences, a repertoire that included everything from Shakespeare to melodrama to vaudeville. This endeavor was not unusual, for in 19th century America, Shakespeare was popular entertainment. And the theater was a kaleidoscopic democratic institution presenting a widely varying bill of fare to all classes and socioeconomic groups. As Colorado's gold rush began to falter, resulting in a slowing of the economy, Langrish and his troops sought newer gold rush towns farther north. In 1867, they took a perilous journey through hostile Indian territory to Salt Lake City, hauling costumes as they traveled then made their way to Virginia City, soon to be Montana territory, which was experiencing a gold rush. Just before they reached their destination, the troops stopped to relax and enjoy some hunting and fishing. Their mules strayed, and while searching for them, one, later, one actor later wrote that they found a partial remains of a man, the skull large and symmetrical with beautiful teeth. 
Looking at that skull, all the property man Jimmy Griffith thought of was Yorick. So they took it with them and used the skull in Hamlet and continued to carry the prop with them for years to come. This anecdote trades in the notion that Montana territory was so wild that there were skeletons lying around for the picking. But it also makes the unexpected shift whereby this potential tragedy is transferred into Yorick's jesting grin. In many ways, this is the perfect metaphor for the role of the itinerant actors of the frontier. Langrish's company performed several plays in Virginia City during their first visit, including Romeo and Juliet and Othello. And accounts in the Montana Post, Montana's first newspaper, portray a town hungry for such a spectacle. Tonight, Othello is up, announced the paper, and the bare announcement it is enough to crowd the house to repletion. This one was, everyone agreed, the best theater that these miners had ever had the privilege to watch. Langrish's troupe came regularly to Virginia City, Helena, and some other Montana mining towns once or twice a year in the 1860s and early 70s, providing regular entertainment. When the company performed in Helena in 1868, one reviewer wrote that, the great play of Hamlet possessing in itself such sterling merit that it never becomes old was well presented last night. The starring actor, Mr. Waldron, with that quick conception of dramatic effects which has ensured him such a favorable reputation from our citizens, gave such a rendering of Hamlet that brought clearly out all the beauties of the great Shakespearean character. The portrayal of Shakespeare's epic heroes was conveyed through the exaggerated acting that was popular in the 19th century. The actors, like their stories, needed to be expansive enough to fill the bare stages of Montana. So audiences were attracted to plays and performers that conveyed a sense of beauty, greatness, and moral purpose. The Montana Post reports, while usually enthusiastic, demonstrated, though, a nuanced understanding of theatrical performance, of Shakespeare's drama, and of celebrity culture. Their review of one Othello production was measured, admitted that it was not a superb rendering, never before equaled on the American stage, largely because the actor playing Othello, George Ponsford, Ponsfort, has unfortunately no pathos in his voice. Othello was one of the most popular plays in performance during this period, so the audience members had the privilege of seeing multiple renditions of this tragedy. The pathos that they expected from the war was unsatisfying to this audience, perhaps lending credence to Helen Kuhn's assertion that the miners felt most drawn to the larger-than-life Shakespearean characters because their own quest for gold, their hardships, the very scenery around them was larger than the world they had known back east, and they could see their own feelings mirrored in powerful emotions. The Montana Post found much more to praise in another star, Mrs. Langrish, especially in her role as Juliet, because although the actress did not seem natural for the part, on stage she became a sprightly, coquettish girl with all the appearance of a boarding school miss in love for the first time face as bright as the May morning and every moment girlish in the extreme, and thus she assumed the part with a perfection seldom equaled. Such detailed descriptions of actress portrayals point to the deep interest that Virginia City viewers had in seeing performances that reflected their notions of how Shakespeare should be staged. As these comments about Sh uh, Juliet suggest, the audience tastes were not only for the declamatory and the moralistic, but also for models of femininity based on a drawing room ideal, the coquettish and bright girlish figures of upper class society. The repertoire that the Langrish Company featured allowed for a mix of comedy and tragedy, and of course melodrama, which was the most popular genre in the late 19th century. Langrish often gave his audience a taste for all of these genres in the course of one evening, mounting productions such as Othello and Macbeth, which with all their tragic tragic grandeur, but then following them with a vaudeville short show. Langrish was able to shine in these entertainments, for he was frequently dubbed the comedian of the frontier. Importantly, he marked his theater as wholesome entertainment, an alternative to the violence and vaudry for which the mining camps were otherwise known. He refused to, play his, uh, to perform plays on Sunday and was connected to the Episcopal Church. Mining towns were marked by excitement and spontaneity, but with that came a longing for the traditions of the places from which the pioneers came and their attendant stability. 
Shakespeare was one avenue by which they could forge a cultural continuity, making the miners feel that they were indeed a vital part of a continuing story. One account by a performance by language, um, sorry, one account of a performance by Languish's company in Helena in 1867 also demonstrates what it meant to be excluded from the communities created through the shared of appreciation of drama. The United States Marshal and his deputies wanted to attend the tragedy that was on that night, one of Shakespeare's. So they took their prisoner with them, an Indian who had been arrested for illegal liquor sales. During the performance, quote, all went well until the actors started killing each other in great shape. The Indian, thinking it all in earnest, became frightened, jumped through a window onto the porch, ran to his horse, and dashed away. The joke at the expense of the unlearned Indian serves as an uncomfortable metaphor for what it meant to civilize the frontier. The savages needed to exit, leaving the theaters and their accompanying cultural activities to do the work of creating a stable and lawful community. Here we can see a marked shift from the Shakespeare-inspired men of the West, such as Custer and Buffalo Bill, who made it their business to kill Indians, literally or on stage, to a moment in which the Indian is portrayed as a laughable threat who exits of his own accord because he cannot understand the civilizing force of theater. Looking at the map of the places visited by Langrish and the itinerant actors that traveled with him, one is struck by the geographical scope of their profession. They regularly went back and forth between places such as Colorado, Montana, New Orleans, Chicago, Salt Lake, Deadwood, and Coeur d'Alene. The constant movement of the actors mirrored the quickly shifting nature of frontier towns that were dependent upon mining economies. During gold booms, the excitement and spontaneity lent themselves to celebrity uh, celebratory atmospheres. The theater became part of that. Each time that the players returned to Montana, residents of the mining towns were enthusiastic. During Langrish's return to Helena in 1883, apparently throngs of Montanans waited in hotels, eager for the first handshake. By this time, transportation was also easier, for the actors were able to travel via the Northern Pacific Railroad, a symbol of the frontier that was now connected through the emerging, emerging economy enabled by the Iron Horse. Given the profound impact that Langrish had on several mining communities, it is surprising to witness his own forlorn words about the profession of acting. He said, your words do not live like the poets or painters to be seen or read by everyone. The actor's art is different. He struts his brief hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Remarkably, remarkably, the words are Macbeth's, and the endurance of Shakespeare resonates, even as Langrish himself worries that he will fade from memory. When he did pass away in 1895, the newspapers of the Rockies were filled with reports of Langrish's death. A Leadville, Colorado obituary aptly quoted from one Henry IV, could not all this flesh keep a little, in a little life? Poor Jack, farewell. We could have better spared a better man. Langrish's legacy is that he brought professional theater to Montana territory so early and with such frequency that the inhabitants of its towns regularly availed themselves of the opportunity to see a mixture between, Shakespeare, between comic skits and Shakespearean tragedy. This interplay serves both the moral agenda and the need for entertainment that were integral to performing the domestication of the frontier. Part three, women's roles. As my anecdotal history of uh, so far makes clear, the Montana frontier was largely a masculine domain, dominated by explorers, trappers, scouts, and miners who were invariably male. But the residents of mining towns such as Virginia City were mostly men. Because of this, sometimes an amateur acting company had to be creative in its approach. Thus, one such company in Junction near Virginia City took a page from Shakespeare's era, solving the problem of female characters simply by dressing up a boy in one of our mother's dresses. This was a workable solution. However, one can see why the miners were excited to see actresses perform the women's roles on the frontier. Langrish's troupe was substantially composed of families, for he always traveled with his wife, just as the actor Charles Kolduck always traveled and performed with his daughter Eliza. Family connections helped the troupe to convey the idea that the theater was not in fact transient, but a symbol of urban permanence. 
a young woman such as Eliza elicited a great deal of appreciation from the largely male audience. The townspeople regularly organized benefit performances, and at one point, Eliza was the featured actor. actor. At the end, she was presented with a 20-ounce gold nugget worth $450. The Montana Post hailed this occasion as a tribute to Eliza's ability to touch the tender cord in the heart of the digger and delver in the ground. Other actions between actors and audience members show a complex negotiation of sexual politics on the frontier, as evidenced by the remarkable story of Laura Honey Agnes Stevenson. I like using all four of her names. The daughter of a well-known London actress, Stevenson herself reputedly sang the Shakespearean song Over Hill, Over Dale in London under Charles Keene when she was young. But later, the talented singer and actress became nearly destitute traveling throughout the American West in the, in the 1860s and 70s, accompanied only by her husband manager. Stevenson was remembered in particular for her one-woman performance of the balcony scene of, in Romeo and Juliet. In the absence of an actor to be Romeo, she employed a dummy clothing figure such as is frequently seen in the front of the gents' furnishing stores surmounted by a, a handsome blockhead and dressed it in a rich velvet cap, a cloak, and feathers. This performance was a burlesque of the balcony scene interspersed with piano playing and singing for further entertainment. The newspaper advertised it as Opera Mad, Opera Mad, or Romeo and Juliet. The miners called Stevenson Julio and loved it when she made love to Romeo after a style that kept the house in a continuous roar. Shortly after the Deer Lodge performance, Stevenson remounted the same show in the neighboring placer camp of Pioneer with equal success. This is how the newspaper described it. The scene was given with great eclat. The applause was tumultuous. It was Shakespeare's introduction to a Pioneer audience. It was enjoyed and was unanimously agreed upon that the Honey Stevenson show was a hummer. Leaving the performance hall and migrating to the saloon, the rowdy miners of Pioneer took the Romeo dummy with them and forced him to browse with them all night. The damage was substantial. His red shirt was torn to shreds, his nose bit off, his eyes gouged out, and his cheeks mashed in. Sheepishly, the miners returned the remains of Rummy to Stevenson, who wailed in a dramatic performance of grief, saying, dead, 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 my Romeo, my Romeo, speak to me this once. Tell me you love me. It cannot be that he is dead. Romeo, Romeo, my darling Romeo. Yes, yes, he is dead, dead. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, speak. <laughs> this performance, which sounds in tone and action so much like Thisbe's lament over the dead body of Pyramus in Midsummer Night's Dream, was first so sorrowful, sorrowful and then appreciated for its histrionics that the miners generously raised more than enough funds for her to replace her most prized prop. Stevenson continued to entertain on stages in Helena, Missoula, and beyond, but her infamous performance as Juliet remained strong in Montana lore. Like Jim Bridger's encounters with Shakespeare, this story circulated widely and in several versions, appearing in newspapers in New York, Kansas, and Oregon, adding a mythological quality to what it meant for people on the Montana frontier to encounter Shakespeare. When theatrical impresario John McGuire reflected upon Stevenson, the Stevenson legend in The Anaconda Standard in 1898, a couple of decades after it had occurred, he told it against the background of excitement of those gold rush communities, where the thespian had to move his cart to fresh fields and pastures new. But the effort was worth it, for they prospered, because it was fresh, refreshing to the people to have something beyond and above their own little improvised entertainments to break the monotony of the long nights. Using Shakespeare's celebrated dis description of Brutus, McGuire called Jack Langrish the noblest Roman of them all, who strode onto the stages, as did the other itinerant actors, in primitive conditions. But McGuire further reflected that, I often think that the performances of those days, given as they were with the most crude surroundings, were to the people of that time much more pleasurable and delightful than the most artistic performances of many celebrities to our blasé audiences of the present. For McGuire, 
The Laura, Laura Honey Stevenson story likewise harkens back to a golden age where all things seemed possible, even quality and hilarious Shakespearean entertainment, courtesy of a, a single actress and a mannequin. Such nostalgia is ultimately a byproduct of domestication. By the turn of the 20th century, many Montana areas were settled, not just because of gold mining, but because of copper mining that it was bringing electricity to the, to the nation. As Montana began to look like other places, there was occasion to remember fondly an unsettled and wild past, populated by tales of the kind I have been discussing. At the same time, however, women took increasingly important roles in enhancing Montana communities, including civic engagement projects and the formation of women's clubs that were devoted to the study of literature, often evoking Shakespeare as a central part of their mission. These Montana women were not only teaching one, with one another about history and literature, but forging communities that negotiated between the natural environment of the frontier and the notion of progress. Women's suffrage was a key interest of this, these groups. Thus, the participants mined literary analogs that could help them think through their aspirations for the future improved place of women. Their self-designed curricula included discussions of Beatrice and Desdemona alongside Ibsen's A Doll's House. Giving voice to these connections, the famed Shakespearean actress Ellen Terry, whom some of you noticed from the previous slide, came to Montana in 1910 and was asked whether Beatrice would have been a suffragist if she had been alive now. And Terry's answer was that Beatrice, Rosalind, Portia would all be suffragists for the question of women's rights is not new. The myriad ways in which the club women use Shakespearean performance to explore their own roles as new women in the West is something I do not have sufficient time to, to cover right now. But I will give you one representative example of Montana women taking on the task of Shakespearean performance. The year was 1902, the place was Great Falls. The women's reading group decided to perform a Midsummer Night's Dream. At this time, it included Nancy Russell, the wife of Charlie R Russell, the uh, artist that I showed you a picture of at the beginning. This outdoor production engaged intimately with the physical landscape. Participants rose rode upon a hay wagon to a large field where the housewives in lacy muslin had prepared to play all of the parts, except for Bottom, who was played by an actual donkey. I don't know how that worked, but that's what it says. The wagon became mired in a slough, and the performance was eventually rained out, but not before one of the actors confidently gestured toward the field and declared in the words of the play, here's a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. The storm truncated performance was memorialized in a drawing by Charlie Russell with the caption, a midsummer night's dream turns tempest, but all's well that ends well. <laughs> Russell, known for his iconic paintings of the Western landscape, placed Shakespeare in this place as well. The fairies of Britain reimagined in a field outside of Great Falls. Trees and fields of Shakespeare's plays became part of the insistent expression of Montana's landscape, with the cowboy artist of the West sketching the event as it unfolded, subject to the elements. Yet why do we know of this event at all? Because the daughter of one of these women wrote an article about it for Montana, the magazine of Western history in 1972. At this time, as the 20th century was beginning to draw towards its close, the pervasive nostalgia that attended representations of Montana's past was more noticeable than ever. Telling and retelling stories of Shakespearean encounters and performances had become a way of remembering and constructing the icons in which Montana still trades. And now for the last section. Wild West Shakespeare in the Parks. Montana is frequently known by his moniker, Big Sky Country, and its motto is the last best place. Everything about the state still invites reflection upon the wide open spaces which seem to beg to be filled, not by people, of course, but by stories. The impulse to let Shakespeare speak in all regions of the state inspired a Montana-born theater professor named Bruce Jacobson to create a company called Montana Shakespeare in the Parks in 1973. This touring company, which still flourishes today, 
is comprised of professional actors who travel around Montana and surrounding states performing two plays and repertory. This beloved cultural organization has maintained its mission to make quality live theatrical productions of Shakespeare and other classics accessible to communities in Montana and surrounding states with an emphasis on underserved rural areas that would not otherwise have this opportunity. Shakespeare in the Parks companies exist all over the world, but this one takes a special pride in being uniquely Montanan. A tribute written about Bruce Jacobson when he passed away in 2006 reflected that this founder was all Montanan and as much of a cowboy as anyone I've met. For who else would dare to pull into town, set up a ramshackle stage, beat a drum to attract a crowd, put on a play, Shakespeare no less, and ride out the next day in search of new adventures, leaving behind a group of fascinated locals, much richer for the experience. The mythological lure of such a company attracted actors from the eastern part of the country who were e hungry to have exactly this sort of experience. One such actor was Bill Pullman who grew up watching westerns, so he was excited to see the places that the filmic imagination had imparted to him. So he agreed to be part of, and I'm gonna call it MSIP for, from now on, means Montana Shakespeare in the Parks, because it's too clunky. Uh, Bill Pullman agreed to be part of MSIP in 1978, not because he wanted to do Shakespeare, but because he wanted to be out west. His years as an actor and director for the company laid the groundwork for an enormously successful acting career that included Broadway credits as well as films such as Ruthless People, Sleepless in Seattle, While You Were Sleeping, and Independence Day. If you can't picture Bill Pullman, if you saw a picture of him, I know you would know who he is. Yet he calls Montana his home still, for he identifies with the landscape and people that he met in the 70s doing Shakespeare. Pullman recalls that he always hated wearing tights. For in MSIP's early seasons, the settings were usually Elizabethan. As time passed, however, approaches diversified. In the, company's, uh, in the company's 46 seasons, the impulse to set the plays in the Old West has been especially strong. So if Pullman had stuck around Montana uh, rather than going to Hollywood, he, would, he could have worn cowboy hats and spurs on stage instead. In MSIP's history, no play has been performed more often than Taming of the Shrew. In both 1989 and 2015, the play was set in the 19th century West. The 1989 production was directed by MSIP veteran actor-director Tom Morris and included favorite Western songs such as Don't Fence Me In. The year was appropriate for the production because it was the centennial of Montana's statehood. Morris envisioned this shrew as a sort of fantasy placed in a Montana ghost town that mysteriously disappeared in 1889 and was reappearing throughout the summer in 1989. The Christopher Sly frame was employed to suggest multiple time periods. In 18, uh, 1989, he was envisioned as Wild Bill Shakespeare, an overlay of Wild Bill Hickok as a symbol of the lawless West and Shakespeare as the author of the fantasy. The costumes let, lent a great deal of flavor to the play and caused one Shakespeare newspaper headline to dub this Shakespeare in Chaps. This article further explains the creative combination between the 19th century and the 1980s that the production design evoked. In lieu of Shakespeare, the English bard soliloquies, the cast with tongue-in-cheek humor substituted cowboy ballads. As a spoof on cowboy chaps, various members of the cast showed up in a reasonable facsimile of white angora, tiger skin, and leopard printed leg coverings. Ah, the 1980s, okay. The 2015 production was more interested in staying with the unified period design, especially one that would emphasize class disparity. The costume uh, supported this concept by showing a contrast between clean, well-polished edges for the wealthy characters versus distressed canvas or leather on the gunslinger, hardworking ranch and farmhands. For the director, Kevin Aslin, the Western setting was a way to make the show seem relevant to members of the Montana communities, but it also proved to be a great deal of fun to find new ways of keeping Shakespeare's stories alive. Both productions used the Western theme to bring out the play's physical humor. Scenes featured characters with lariats and guns who were prone to fistfights that could get them thrown out of the local saloon. The violence of the society, Montana in Morris's production and South Pass City, Wyoming in Aslan's, 
extended to the courtship in Shakespeare's play. In this setting, Petruchio's taming of Kate included physical gestures that mimicked riding bucking broncos and roping calves. Such interactions, however, highlighted the uncomfortable gender politics of this play. Morris handled this difficult dimension of shrew by making the misogyny a fantasy that was part of an imagined West. The Elizabethan thing tends to get a little misogynistic, Morris admitted. But if you set up Petruchio as a gunfighter, it's part of the Wild West cliche and a little more believable. The artistic director at that time agreed that this approach puts the chauvinistic portion of the play in perspective. It makes it a sort of fantasy. Making misogyny into a fantasy does not, of course, erase it. And in 1989, there were several ways in which the Western fantasy reinforced gender and racial stereotypes, too. More productively, these shrew revivals evoked another piece of the West's cliched history by featuring rugged female gunfighters. Morris cast Kate as an Annie Oakley figure, and Aslan chained Petruchio's servant Grumio into Grumia, who re resembled Calamity Jane, and that's her on the right, right there. In the latter adaptation, Grumia was a rough product of Wyoming's lawless society, but as a woman, she also looked with disapproval at the way Kate was being treated. Making Grumio into a female character from 19th century Wyoming deliberately reflected upon the history of the women's suffrage movement, especially this state's, state's proud place as the first in the US to give women the right to vote. And that is part of the US Western history that people often don't know is that it actually begins with Wyoming and Montana and other states that votes for uh, women's suffrage. As I have shown, the independence of Laura Honey Stevenson and the members of the Great Falls Women Club show related impulses to take control of Shakespeare as a way of giving order and shape to their desires for an equal footing in the wide open spaces of Montana. Yet these women, like Buffalo Bill and Calamity Jane, understood that everything they did on stage and off was a performance. Both Morris and Aslan, the two directors, found in Petruchio and Kate's relationship a truer, more genuine understanding that allowed them to rise above the problems inherent in the relationships around them. The surprise twist at the end of the 2015 production was that when Petruchio asked Kate to explain to the women what duty they do owe their lords and husbands, he pointed not to Bianca or to the widow when he said, and first begin with her, but to Hortensio. In this way, the entire speech that Kate gave about womanly obedience was part of the couple's mutually constructed performance, which in turn foregrounded the performative roots of gender and power in the West mythology. The next two paragraphs I suppose I'll call my postscript. Buffalo Bill died around the time that motion pictures were bringing into being a genre called the Western. He would well have appreciated the power of film to create the myth of the West. Filmic reworkings of this genre remain strong today, and by the same token, it's nothing new to set Shakespeare in the West. Consider, for example, films such as King of Texas and Yellow Sky. As it turns out, though, the other Bill, and I don't mean Bill Shakespeare or Bill Hickok or, um, uh, or Buffalo Bill, in this case I mean Bill Pullman, did have a chance to wear a cowboy hat and chaps after all. Last year, he starred with Peter Fonda in a post-Western called The Ballad of Lefty Brown, which was filmed in five Montana locations. Pullman also managed to return to his own history by populating some of the movie scenes with extras who included several of his compatriots from MSIP. Like the self-referential productions of Shrew set in the Wild West, this nod to the Montana Shakespeare veterans was an insider reference to the past that all of these actors shared. But to return for a moment to those Old West productions of Shrew and other plays, such stagings in Montana have participated in an eclectic mashup that uses Western icons as a backdrop for Shakespeare's stories. It is perhaps the greatest irony that so few of the audience members and artists of these plays have any idea that from the earliest constructions of the Montana persona, Shakespeare was always part of the story. The authors of that state-by-state -state book with which I began chose to do Shakespeare on the face of Montana because of the popularity of Montana Shakespeare in the parks. But as it turns out, the image is far more appropriate than anyone could have guessed. As it turns out, 
all Montana roads lead to Shakespeare. The sense that this region is a stage has created a role for Shakespeare in Montana's history and mythology. The spaces of performance are both imagined and real, always finding their strongest iterations at the vanishing point of the frontier. Thank you.